trust your common sense and look at what we're doing, what you'll find is we can solve our problems, we can come together as a nation, and we can fix what ails us, and we can do that without destroying the future of our children and grandchildren. I yield the floor to my colleague from Alabama. President. Senator from Alabama. I would ask consent that I'll be able to enter into a colloquy with Senator Coburn if he has a moment to stay um, for um, up to 10 minutes. Without objection. Uh, Senator Coburn, you served on the Debt Commission. You had no burden uh, to run for re-election. I'm so glad you did. You're one of the most valuable members of this Senate. But I have an understanding and that you came here uh, to try to do something about the debt this country faces. Is that fair to say? And that you um, believe that this Congress has a responsibility to confront what Admiral Mullen calls is the greatest threat to our national security, which is our debt. You also have tremendous experience as a practicing physician. You practiced up until the very day you were elected. How many years ago now? Uh, seven years ago. And continued to practice even while in the Senate until the bureaucrats uh, made it impossible, I guess, to do so. So you come here with practical experience, a brilliant mind, and a committed committed vision for America, and, and I, I appreciate you sharing your frustration about what's occurred this week. This is a quote that was in the Wall Street Journal uh, by um, a Democratic Senate strat strategist um, and about this scheme and plan that resulted in four votes yesterday, uh, four votes that the majority in had conceived in such a way that they were guaranteed to fail and nothing was going to happen. It was a guaranteed plan to assure nothing would happen. And this is what they said about it. As a political matter, and I'm quoting from the journal, while Democratic strategists say they may, there may be little benefit in producing a budget that would inevitably include unpopular items. Now, you are famous for telling the truth, and if you would, I'd like you to respond to that. What does that say about our Senate, that the Democrats say that there would be little political benefit in producing a budget that might include unpopular items? Isn't a tough budget that gets us on the right path has got to have some things in it that uh, some people might not like? Well, to my colleague through the chair, I, uh, I would answer, <clears throat> what is our obligation? Uh, is our obligation to win the next election, or is our obligation to solve the problems in front of our country? You know, it, it's not even a matter about having votes. We can't even get bills on the floor with amendments that actually will save some money right now. I mean, let, let me give you an example. We had the small business bill up. The only thing that we've done of significance since we've been back in this session, it, it took two weeks to get a bipartisan amendment that would save $5 billion out of the duplication that was reported by the Government Accountability Office, hundreds of billions of dollars. It took two weeks to finally get a vote on that. Myself and my colleague from Virginia co-sponsored that. It won. That's one of the reasons we didn't finish the bill is because they don't want to do that. They don't want to make the hard choices. And so what, you know, the, 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 it's an abrogation of our responsibility to not do the hard part that comes over the job. You know, we get, the job comes with a whole lot of rasping on your skin. You know, it is, you're going to get criticized. But the ultimate fatal criticism is to make a choice not to get your, put yourself in the position to be criticized. So what we're saying is, we're going to do nothing. We're, we're, we're going to not do what we are constitutionally supposed to do by April 15th every year, and that's have a budget. We're not going to debate the issues. We're not going to cast hard votes because somebody may affect somebody's election outcome. Well, how, how big of a cowards are we? 
that we can't defend the vote that we make? I don't have any problem. You throw the hardest vote from the other side of me, I'll, 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 I'll make a decision on it, whether I think it's right or wrong, and then I'll defend it. But to not vote at all is an absolute abrogation of our oath. And that's the leadership that we are experiencing. And it's not just Democrat leadership. We have some on our side that don't want to cast hard votes either. The point is, is the American people need us to be casting hard votes now. Our problems are greater than at any time since World War II. The challenge to our country is greater than World War II. The outcome of our republic depends on us solving the very real and urgent and difficult problems in front of us. And to do so in a way that preserves the future of this country and reestablishes and reforms us to where we get our mojo back before we start believing in ourselves again. And to not do it and not to have the courage to sacrifice your own position for the betterment of this country, that's what we ought to be about. And I don't see that. Well, let me ask the senator. Uh, you just won an overwhelming re-election. Um, there's not a senator here that I think anybody would dispute has been more frank in expressing the need that all of us are going to have to rein in our spending who've told and shared that directly with your constituents when they've asked for things. You've tried to help them, I know, but you're frank with uh, your constituents. Uh, would you share with us what kind of percentage you got in the last election? I got 71.8%. 71%. I don't think it's... Do you think perhaps that some of our, us here in Washington over... Uh, over afraid of being frank and truthful with our constituents about the challenges America faces? Well, I, I would answer through, through the uh, president that I think we're perplexed. We, we, we see, we know intellectually that there's a big problem. And we have this challenge of do I go down this path to do the best thing for the country, or do I go down this path to do the best thing for me? And I, I look at politics different than most of our colleagues. I, to the Senator for Alabama, I would say, I don't really care whether I'm here or not. I'm here because I care about whether America's here or not. Uh, but our point ought to be is how do we secure the vote, and how do we establish trust with the American people? Go, if my colleague would go, and, and, and I know he knows this, look at the confidence of the people in this country in the Congress. Why is there a lack of confidence? You know, why is it that 80% of the people in the United States don't have any confidence in Congress? I can tell you why. It's because we haven't built trust and credibility with those very people. And I, I can tell you, I get letters all the time from people that disagree with me. I mean, they'll write me, and I actually, I'm involved in every answer to every inquiry that comes into my office. I actually read them, because I want to know what the people from Oklahoma say. But even though they disagree with me, they vote for me because they trust me, because I'm not gaming them, like we've seen the gaming on Medicare. You know, our problems are real. The solutions are difficult. But American can overcome that if we come together. If we stay divided, like we've seen in here, with no budget votes, no hard votes, and we try to game it for politically, what we're doing is undermining our country's future. I, and it doesn't matter who wins the next election. What we need to be doing is saving America. Well, you, the, Senator uh, Coburn, you served on the Debt Commission, and I know there's been a concerted effort to blame uh, and exaggerate and distort the House budget, um, particularly as it referred to Medicare. This is what the Wall Street Journal, again quoting Democratic strategist, uh, Senate strategist, um, what they had, what he, the Wall Street Journal said, quote, many Democrats believe a recent House GOP proposal to overhaul Medicare is proving to be unpopular and has given Democrats a political advantage they are loath to give that up by proposing higher taxes, which they would pr prefer as a solution. Democrats plan to hold a vote on the Ryan plan, which they did yesterday, 
hoping to force GOP senators to cast a vote on Medicare overhaul that could prove politically difficult. Um, you served on the Debt Commission. This is what your commission chairman uh, said in a written statement after Paul Ryan and the House Democrats produced their budget. Quote, the budget released this morning by the House Budget Committee, Chairman Paul Ryan, is a serious, honest, straightforward approach to addressing our, our nation's enormous fiscal challenges. We applaud him for his work in putting forward a proposal which will reduce the country's deficit by the approximately the same amount as the President's Fiscal Commission. They also went on to say, uh, if you criticize it, you have a responsibility to offer an alternative. You served with uh, uh, Mr. Bowles, he was the uh, Democratic uh, uh, Chief of Staff to President Clinton and, and was appointed by uh, President Obama to chair this commission. Now, that doesn't sound like the things we heard yesterday attacking uh, 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 the House Ryan budget, does it? You know, it, 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 it doesn't, but I, it, it's interesting to note that the President's Deficit Commission was set up by the President, had six of his nominees on it, had six Republicans, and six Democrats. Five of the six presidential nominees that he nominated agreed with the Deficit Commission. Three of the six Republicans agreed, and three of the Democrats. A pretty good meeting in the middle. And yet, the president didn't embrace the results of his own commission. Did not embrace the results of the people that he appointed. So what was the purpose of that exercise? Was it to make political hair or was it to solve the problems? And the fact is that I have five colleagues in the Senate that have been working hard on that over the past five months to try to build a bipartisan um, uh, agreement out, out of the basis of that. That's what has to happen, except politics. And, you know, I'd go back and, and just refer to my colleague. If you look at the history of republics, the track record isn't real good. Uh, the average age of the world's republics is 207 years. That's their average age. And, you know, we're, we're 27 years past the average. The question is, is can we cheat history? Can we not fall like the rest of the republics over the very same things? They all fell over fiscal issues. They let their spending get out of control, they let their debt get out of control, and then they couldn't afford the promises that they had made. And so I would just say to my colleague, I have, I, I, this is not an issue of the budget chairman. This is an issue of the leadership of the Senate that doesn't want a budget. And, and we ought to be very clear that the American people know that Congress is not doing its job, this body for sure, because we're not making the hard choices that we were sent up here to make. And what we're doing is punning. And we're going to come to crisis, and the crisis is going to be painful, and it's going to be much more painful than had we made the hard choices today. So I want, I want to thank the, the ranking member of the Budget Committee for his leadership. Um, we can solve any problem in front of us, Mr. Ranking Member, but we've got to do it together, and we can't deny that the problems exist. I thank uh, uh, Senator Coburn for his leadership, and I've watched uh, him with admiration uh, over the years with consistency and fidelity to the national interest work to bring our spending under control. I see my colleague Senator Alexander here and would yield the floor, and I would just follow up before I do that with a, a quote from Erskine Bowles, uh, when the president announced his budget not long after the deficit commission that he'd called together, had made some pretty good proposals about how to improve fiscal matters in the United States. Mr. Bowles was obviously deeply disappointed with the, what the president submitted and said, uh, this pl plan goes nowhere near where they will have to go to meet our country's fiscal nightmare.
And I think that's the consensus that we are facing a fiscal night where we're going to have to take some serious steps uh, in that regard. And Mr. President, I, I think there's some other members who have reserved time. If there are no other members here that have reserved time after Senator Alexander uh, completes his remarks, I would ask unanimous consent that I be recognized at that time. Without objection. Uh, Mr. Mr. President, if, 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 I, I, I won't object. I think Senator Hatch is expecting to come down Senator Sessions. That's the only one I know. After. As I said, if any, my consent would be that uh, if anyone has reserved time, they would get it before I would speak. Senator from Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. President. I congratulate Senator Sessions, Senator Colburn for their principled remarks about uh, about the phenomenon of Washington spending. We're spending 40 cents, we're borrowing 40 cents of every dollar we spend. We can't continue, we can't keep spending money we don't have. And we want to save Medicare. So those two major difficult decisions are things we need to work on together. Stopping spending money we don't have and saving Medicare. We can do both, put our minds to it. Mr. President, I'd like to speak. I ask consent to speak for up to 15 minutes. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, if you could let me know when one minute remains, I would appreciate it. Mr. President, uh, last month the Acting General Counsel of the National Labor Relations Board filed a complaint against the nation's largest exporter, the Boeing Company, company with 170,000 some employees, 155,000 of them in the United States, a company that sells airplanes around the world and makes them in the United States. The complaint basically said that it was a prima facie evidence of, of, of illegal discrimination uh, because Boeing has decided to build uh, an, auto, uh, an airplane production plant in South Carolina. Uh, the point being that Boeing's main operation is in Washington State, a state without a right to work law, and South Carolina is a state with a right to work law. This notwithstanding the fact that Boeing is adding 2,000 employees in Washington State, it's nearly finished this new plan in South Carolina, spend, spending a billion dollars, hiring 2,000 people, and all of a sudden here comes this complaint. This is not just a South Carolina matter. It affects the entire country, and many of us have spoken out about it. I want to review it just for a moment. This complaint against Boeing is just one indication of the administration's anti-business, anti-growth, and anti-jobs agenda. That's why Senators Graham, DeMint, and I, actually there are 34 senators who are co-sponsoring this bill, have introduced the Job Protection Act to protect right-to-work states and employers from an independent government body run amok. Our bill preserves the federal law's current protection of state right-to-work laws in the National Labor Relations Act and provides necessary clarity to prevent the NLRB from moving forward in its case against Boeing or attempting a similar strategy against other companies. Now it seems that the NLRB wants to change the rules governing how and when a company can relocate from one state to another. According to a May 10th internal memorandum from the NLRB General Counsel's Office, it wants to give unions power over major business decisions and require companies such as Boeing to collectively bargain if the company wants to relocate a facility. As was explained by James Shirk, a senior policy analyst in labor economics, and Hans A. von Spakovsky, a senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation in a recent article in National Review Online, quote, NLRB wants to force companies to provide detailed economic justifications, including underlying cost or benefit considerations for relocation decisions to allow unions to bargain over them, or lose the right to make those decisions without bargaining over them. Either way, businesses would have to negotiate their investment plans with union bosses, unquote. Shirk and von Spakovsky described this as a heads I win, tails you lose scenario for the unions. These decisions belong 
at the corporate boardroom, Mr. President, not at the collective bargaining table. The goal of this National Labor Relations Board seems to be to place the interests of organized labor over those of business, shareholders, and economic growth. Their means is to change well-established law governing business decisions under the National Labor Relations Act. The Supreme Court has risen that a, quote, employer must have some degree of certainty beforehand as to when it may proceed to reach decisions without fear of later evaluations labeling its conduct an unfair labor practice, unquote. Under the Dubuque packing case and subsequent NLRB jurisprudence, a company may make a major business decision such as relocation outside of collective bargaining. Accordingly, the burden is initially on the NLRB general counsel to establish that an employer's decision to relocate work is unaccompanied by a basic change in the nature of the employer's operation, such as being part of an overarching restructuring plan. The Dubuque case test was most recently applied by the NLRB in holding that a company, the Embark Corporation, did not violate the law by refusing to provide information about or bargain over a planned relocation of its Nevada call center to Florida. Both of those happen to be right to work states, as Tennessee is. In a concurring opinion, the NLRB Chairman Lieberman expressed her desire, though, to change the rules governing relocation decisions and collective bargaining. The chairman noted her displeasure that, in her words, the law doesn't compel the production of information fully explaining the underlying cost of benefit considerations of a company's relocation decision. The chairman then suggested requiring employers to provide unions with economic justification wherever there was a, quote, reasonable likelihood that labor cost concessions might affect an impending decision to relocate. In practice, the burden would shift to the employer before making its relocation to advise and explain to its union the basis for its decision supported by detailed economic justification. Then, if it does turn on labor costs, the employer would be required to provide the union with the information supporting the labor cost savings underlying its decision. If the employer failed to provide such information and labor costs were a factor, it would be precluded from making those decisions without collective bargaining. Following this decision against Embark Corporation, the NLRB Associate General Counsel issued an internal memorandum on May 10, suggesting that Chairman Lieberman's new test should now be examined and considered in all cases concerning relocations that come before the board. Now, I'm all for requiring employers to provide advance notice to their labor organizations and offering the economic reasons for proposed relocation, a shutdown, or transfer of existing or future work. Providing notice and reasoning is already required under existing law and jurisprudence. We included this in our Jobs Protection Act just to make sure the spirit of the law was maintained. But what the NLRB and General Counsel are now proposing goes much further, changes understood law, and places an unreasonable burden on employers. As was observed by Shirk and Spakovsky, this new test would raise the cost to businesses by dragging on collective bargaining, by preventing them from legally executing a decision that's in the best interest of their shareholders until bargaining hits an impasse, and forcing them to provide detailed economic justification and negotiate their investment plans with union bosses before having the right to execute a relocation plan. Effectively, it would give a union a seat at the board of directors through the force of law and tip the scales of justice in their favor. If employers don't comply, then they'll lose the right to later claim that their relocation decision did not have to be collectively bargained under the National Labor Relations Act. So, as with the NLRB Acting General Counsel's action against Boeing, this potential new posture by the Office of General Counsel represents a departure from well-established law. They don't like the outcome, so they want to change the rules and give unions greater leverage over their employers who provide the jobs in the first place. 
They're more concerned about producing outcomes and facilitate the collective bargaining process rather than those that foster economic growth, exports, and jobs. Those decisions are best left to the owners, officers, shareholders, and directors of businesses, not organized labor, not the federal government. This potential change in well-established law would be another blow to manufacturing growth and expansion in the U.S. and further incentive for manufacturers to expand or open a new facility in Mexico, in China, in India to meet their growing needs. Republicans are not the only ones who are outraged by the direction the NLRB seems to be headed in recently. William Gould, who chaired the NLRB during the Clinton administration, was recently quoted in Slate magazine expressing his unease with the board's recent actions. Specifically, he said, quote, the Boeing case is unprecedented, unquote, and that he, quote, doesn't agree with what the acting general counsel has done by trying to equate an employer's concern with strikes that disrupt production and make it difficult to meet deadlines with hostility toward trade unionism, unquote. That's the Clinton LRB general counsel. Coming back to the Boeing issue, which is set to be heard by an administrative judge on June 14th, recent comments in the press from NLRB spokeswoman shed further light on how their agenda flies in the face of the very concept of capitalism. On May 19, various press outlets quoted this spokeswoman, suggesting that the NLRB acting general counsel would drop his case against Boeing if Boeing agreed to build 10 planes in Washington rather than seven. Specifically, she said, quote, we're not telling Boeing they can't build planes in South Carolina. We're talking about one specific piece of work, three planes a month. If they keep those three planes a month in Washington, there's no problem, unquote. So they can build planes in South Carolina, just not the three they'd planned to. So now the federal government, or the NLRB, is sitting on Boeing's board and determining the means of production for American industry. While the economy continues to struggle, and in my state, we've had 24 months of 9% unemployment. Mr. President, our job is to make it easier and cheaper for the private sector to create jobs. The National Labor Relations Board is not acting in the best interest of American workers through its continued attempts to depart from well-established law and dictate integral business decisions to companies. I ask unanimous consent to include in the record a memorandum from the Associate General Counsel of the NLRB dated May 10, as well as an article to which I referred from National Review Online dated May 16. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, if I may, I ask unanimous consent that morning business be extended until 9 p.m. with senators permitted to speak for up to 10 minutes each. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, Senator Corker and I had the privilege of being in Chattanooga on Monday for the opening of Volkswagen's North American plant. It was a great day for our country. Uh, here's a major manufacturer in the world making in the United States what it plans to sell in the United States. And we salute Volkswagen and I salute Chattanooga and Tennessee. One third of our auto manufacturing, of, of our manufacturing jobs in our state are our auto jobs, and there was a new Volkswagen Passat that gets 43 miles a gallon. Uh, and that's good news for Americans who are paying $4 and more a gallon for gasoline. But as I was there at that celebration for these new fuel-efficient cars, and earlier this week at a hearing of the Energy Committee, I was thinking, what if I were say, to say to you or to anyone I might see, while you're worrying about $4 gasoline, did you know that we have sitting over here unused enough fuel that is not oil to power 40% of our light cars and trucks at a lower cost? That's right. We have unused every night enough power to power 40% of our light cars and trucks every night. And we can do that by simply plugging them into the wall 
I'm talking about electric cars and light trucks that almost every major manufacturer is now beginning to make. And we don't have to build one new power plant to do it. Last week, Senator Merkley and I appeared before the Energy Committee before, uh, to talk about our legislation, the Promoting Electric Vehicles Act. I said to the committee the difference between the bill this year and the one the committee reported last year by a vote of 19 to 4, a good bipartisan vote, is that this year the price of gasoline is higher than it was last year, and the cost of our bill this year is less than it was last year. Encouraging electric vehicles is an appropriate short-term role for the federal government. Our legislation establishes short-term incentives for the wide adoption of vehicles in 8 to 15 pilot communities. Our legislation advances battery research. The billion dollars that we save by reducing the cost of last year's bill, we save by avoiding duplication from other research programs. And finally, if you believe that the solution to $4 gasoline and high energy prices is finding more American energy and using less of it, as I do, electric cars and trucks are the best way to use less. Electrifying half our cars and trucks could reduce the use of our foreign oil by one-third, saving money on how we fuel our transportation system and cutting into the billions of dollars we send overseas for foreign oil. So instead of making the speech for the rest of my time, let me tell a short story. It's the story of Ross Perot, the famous Texan, and how he made his money. Back in the 60s, he noticed that the big banks down in Dallas were locking their doors at 5 o'clock. And the banks had all these big computers in the back room, and they were locking them up too. They weren't using them at night. So Mr. Perot made a deal with the banks. Sell me your unused computer time at night, he said. And they did, at cheap rates. And then he went to the states and talked to the governors. This is before I was a governor. And he made a deal with the states to use that cheap computer time to manage Medicaid data. And he made a billion dollars. In the same way, we have enormous amounts of unused electricity at night. A conservative estimate is that we have an amount of energy unused at night that's equal to the output of 65 to 70 nuclear power plants between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. I suspect that's the greatest unused resource in America. What if someone proposed building 60 or 65 nuclear power plants? Actually, I proposed building 100, but if we tried to build 60 or 65 more, it'd take us 30 or 40 years and cost us a half trillion dollars if we could even do it. And what I just said was, that we have an amount of unused electricity that's equal to the output of 60 to 65 nuclear power plants every night in this country between 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. And if we were to use that resource to plug in cars and trucks at night, we could electrify 43% of our cars and trucks without building one new power plant. It's a very ambitious goal to imagine electrifying half our cars and trucks. It would take a long time to do it but it's the best way to reduce our use of foreign oil. Another reason I think it will work is it's easy for consumers, and I am one. For two years, I drove a Toyota Prius, and it was modified to add an A123 battery. I increased my mileage to about 80 or 90 miles per gallon. And I just plugged it in at night at home, very simple. I now have a Nissan Leaf. It's all electric. I have an apartment nearby here at the Capitol, and I just plug it in at night. I don't even have a charger. I just plug it into the wall. And I can drive it about two hours every day and plug it in at night. I haven't bought any gas since January, <laughs> since I got my leaf in Washington, D.C. And I've had no problems, either with the modified Toyota Prius that I drove for two years or the Nissan Leaf that I've driven now for about half a year. Almost every car company is making electric cars today or will soon have them on the market. So if electricity, extra electricity is available and electric vehicles are easy to use and car companies are making them, then why do we need for the government to be involved? That's a good question. For one thing, it's the urgency of the problem. $4 gasoline is killing our economy, throwing a big wet blanket over it, and the only solution is find more, use less, 
and this is the best way to use less. And to my Republican colleagues, I said before our committee, and I would say today, we've been saying for three years in our caucus, find more, use less. We've criticized Democrats for wanting to use less without really wanting to find more. And we're subject to the same criticism. If we want to find more, which I think we should, offshore, on federal lands, and in Alaska, and then we don't have a credible way to use less. Electric cars and trucks is the best way to use less. Another criticism is that it interferes with the marketplace, our bill. It does, but in a short-term and limited way. Short-term incentives for new technologies to jumpstart nuclear energy, to jumpstart natural gas truck fleets, to jumpstart electric cars and trucks in four to five years, I think are appropriate given the urgency of the problem. If I'm here in five years, I'll be the first to say that should be the end of it. If I'm not, I'll come back and argue for its repeal. And finally, conservative groups across the country have said national security demands that we do this. Gary Bauer, president of American Values, as well as Richard Land, president of the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, endorsed our electric cars bill last year, saying that national security concerns overwhelm any opposition to it, and it's the best way to displace our use of oil. That was them talking. Can we afford it? Well, our proposal is a billion dollars cheaper, and it's an authorization bill, and we should be setting priorities, and Senator Merkley and I have agreed that we won't try to pass the bill when it comes before unless we can agree to do it in a way that doesn't add to the debt. So in summary, Mr. President, I would say it's time to address $4 gasoline and high energy prices. To do that, we need to find more American energy offshore, on federal land, in Alaska, but we also need to use less. The single best way to use less is to jumpstart the use of electric cars and trucks. Electric cars and trucks, electricity just a delivery system. The fuel comes from a whole variety of things, natural gas, coal, and other things. So we jumpstart the use of that huge resource that we have just sitting there unused every single night. Our committee approved this bill once before. The problem is worse today than it was when they approved it last year. The bill costs less than it did when they approved it last year. It's an appropriate role for the federal government. We'll work to make sure that if this body were to pass it, that it doesn't increase the debt. I urge my colleagues to report the bill to the floor and to consider encouraging electric cars and trucks as the single best way to use less energy and reduce the use and reduce the cost of gasoline. I thank the Senator from Alabama for his courtesy in listening to my remarks, and I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Alabama. Mr. President, today the Senate declined to vote on whether or not to recess. Someone said the Republicans blocked the Senate from recessing. That's not correct. Republicans uh, wrote a letter to the majority leader uh, and said we should not recess until we have plans set forth and begin to take action to deal with the budget that we have not passed uh, that's required by law to be passed. That's what was done. And so when it came down to the moment to move to recess and vote to recess as we're required to do, to have a recess, a unanimous consent or an actual vote, uh, the majority leader chose not to vote. I guess he wanted to protect his members from having to actually be recorded uh, voting to recess this body when we haven't done our work. The Budget Act, it's in the United States Code, it's in the code book. The Budget Act requires that the Senate commence uh, markup hearings in the Budget Committee by April 1st and that a budget be produced by April 15th. 
Congress doesn't go to jail if it's not passed. I will acknowledge there's no fine. Perhaps there should have been. Congress writes laws, I guess so. They make sure that no consequences occur when they apply to them and they don't comply with their duty. So we didn't do that. The, the majority leader decided to keep us in pro forma session uh, through the week, uh, but to do it in a way that guarantees we'll take no action on a budget. And it's a sad thing, really. It's not a little bitty matter. Our Congress knows that we're in a serious national crisis. And I, I think we can't deny it, and we've got to figure out how to uh, respond to it. I hope that this letter that I'll make a part of the record uh, to the majority leader will have some impact on our colleagues and cause them to reconsider uh, the actions that have been taken so far. It says today marks the 757th day since Congress has adopted a conference report on a budget resolution, since we've adopted a budget. But it goes on, while the Republican House has met its obligations this year, the Democrat-led Senate remains in open defiance of the law. <clears throat> Last year, the Senate did not even call up a budget for a vote, and this year, the Senate didn't this year, the Senate Budget Committee has not even marked up a budget resolution as required under Section 300 of the Congressional Budget Act of 1974. Despite this dubious distinction, the Senate plans to adjourn for a week-long recess on Friday to coincide with Memorial Day, a holiday that honors our men and women in uniform. As our service members put their lives on the line to defend this nation, Surely the least Congress can do is produce a plan to confront the debt that is placing the whole country at risk. House Republicans put forward such a budget weeks ago, an honest plan for prosperity to overcome this na nation's dangerously rising debt, cut wasteful Washington spending, and make our economy more competitive. But in this time of economic danger, the Senate continues to stonewall any action in all action on a 2012 budget. For this reason, we respectfully request you, Mr. Majority Leader, our members of your party in the Senate, to bring forward a budget resolution and schedule a meeting of the Budget Committee, a power which resides only with the majority, to work on that budget. In an interview last week, you stated, quote, there is no need to have a democratic budget, in my opinion. It would be foolish for us to do a budget at this stage, close quote, the majority leader said. So we find these remarks shocking, especially given the state of our fiscal affairs. The co-chairs of President Obama's own fiscal commission recently warned if we do not take swift and serious action to address our rising debt, the United States faces the, quote, most predictable economic crisis in our history. The House completed its work on their fiscal year 2012 budget resolution on April 15th. But no budget can become binding until the Senate acts. In our view, it, be, it would be an astounding abandonment of responsibility for the Senate to go on recess without having taken any steps to produce a budget. We hope that as required by law and in your capacity as majority leader, you change course and follow the example of the Republican-led House and provide the American people with the honest leadership and honest budget they deserve. Until a budget plan is made public and until that plan is scheduled for committee action, on what basis can the Senate justify returning home for a one-week vacation and recess while our spending and debt continue to spiral dangerously out of control. We appreciate your thoughtful consideration of this request and welcome any questions that you might have. Well, Mr. President, we're out of sorts here. 
The American people are not happy with this Congress. They say our polling numbers are as low as they can get. In last fall's election, there was a shellacking, particularly of the big spenders, the ones who want to have more government programs and create more debt. There was an accounting, and I guess there'll be an accounting in the next election. And we all better be sure that we've tried to respond faithfully to the challenges America faces. But I would say, Mr. President, that what has happened this week is a mockery, a sham, a joke. We had four votes yesterday, each one of them carefully, sophisticatedly structured to fail. The one that failed the biggest, of course, was President Obama's budget, which got zero votes, voted down unanimously by this body. It was all designed to suggest that it's impossible for the Senate to pass a budget. But a Senate doesn't even require a super majority to pass a budget. Under this Budget Act that we have, it provides that it gets preference, it has to be brought up promptly, and it can be passed with a simple majority. The Democratic majority, like Republican majorities in the past, have to choose. Will they seek to pass a budget that has broad support of both parties, or will they simply use their majority and pass their budget? You should do one or the other. A good bipartisan budget is always possible, but uh, preferable, but sometimes we have different opinions. And so you, if you have a different view from the other party and you can't reach an agreement, you have a majority, you pass your budget. But you know, when you do that, what happens? When you pass your budget, what happens? You lay out for the American people what you believe. It's one thing to criticize someone else. It's another thing to tell the world what you believe. The House has told the world what they think would be an effective budget for the future. What does this Senate say? Nothing. We haven't even commenced the markup in the Budget Committee. A budget sets forth your vision for the future. It tells how much you want to cut taxes or raise taxes. It tells how much you want to raise spending or reduce spending. It says how much debt you expect to accumulate over the years to come or whether or not you would reach a surplus or a balanced budget. That's what a budget does. And you know, it holds you accountable. You have to defend it. You have to say what it is. And one thing I've been proud about the Republicans over in the House, they met their duty, they produced a budget, and they prepared to defend it. Congressman Ryan uh, it knows what he's talking about. Uh, he's worked on that budget, and he's prepared to defend it. It's been terribly misrepresented, but he's prepared to defend it and explain it and talk to anyone about it. But if our colleagues in the Senate fail to produce a budget, don't produce one at all, it's kind of hard to hold them to account, isn't it? So that's why it's pretty clear that Senator Reid said, why, it's foolish for us to have a budget. It's foolish for us to have a budget because, you know, we would then be in a position to be held accountable. Was he talking about foolish for America to have a budget? Was he expressing a view that it's better for America that we have a budget? No, when he said it's foolish for us to produce a democratic budget, he was talking purely politically. Purely politically. He was saying we think it's smart politics for us not to put our neck on the line to actually expose to the American people what we believe in. We would rather be in a position to criticize those people in the House who actually had the gumption, I guess he would say, the foolish sense to pass a budget and tell the American people what they think. I just, I just have to say, that is not a good, good situation. We didn't have a budget last year. We're not having one this year. Is there any wonder then our deficits continue to spiral out of control to a degree we've never, ever seen before? 
Many have criticized President Bush, and so did I, for that $450 billion budget deficit he produced. I thought it was a, a stunning number. You know, since President Obama has been president, the budget deficits have been $1,200 billion, $1,300 billion, and this year, by September 30th, is projected to be about $1,500 billion. We take in $2.2 trillion this year, we expect, and we will spend $3.7 trillion. It's 40 cents plus of every dollar we spend is borrowed, and we're not confronting that, so we're taking a recess. And when it came time to vote to recess, the majority leader figured out a way to, to uh, uh, go on a, another tack and not have to actually vote to go home because I guess his members felt they would be embarrassed if they had to vote to go home after being in violation of the United States Code to produce a budget. So this is not going away. Let me just say that. This issue is not going away. Every expert, including the chairman of the Fiscal Commission, the commission formed by President Obama, the chairman of which he appointed, Mr. Erskine Bowles, and they told us in a written statement uh, delivered by Mr. Bowles and co-chairman Simpson that this nation has never faced a more predictable financial crisis. We are heading toward that wall at warp speed. We can have a financial crisis. In fact, Mr. Bowles was asked by our chairman, Senator Conrad, when do you think this crisis might occur? He said, two years, maybe less. Alan Simpson said, I think maybe one year. Surely, we have got to get off the debt path we're on, spending, uh, 40, uh, spending uh, so much more than we take in. Forty cents of every dollar we spend is borrowed. We pay interest on it. The interest has the potential to damage our economy in a very significant and substantial way. It could put us in another recession. That's what Mr. Bowles was talking about, a debt crisis, another recession maybe could be perhaps worse than the one we're in. And our projections for fragile growth is scary. It's just not coming back nearly as much as we would like it to. One reason the expert economists tell us is that we're carrying too much debt, and this debt has the potential to pull down our economy. So I think we're in, in, a, in a crisis, but I think the economy is so naturally strong. The American people have so many capabilities, uh, such a good work ethic, that if we get this economy under control and the fiscal house in Washington under control, I believe the economy will come back. But we need to do it and do it now, and every day we delay increases the risk that we'll have a, credit, uh, a crisis occur. So, Mr. President, I, I thank the chair. I saw my colleague, Senator Klobuchar, here. I know she wants to speak tonight. But I want to repeat, this matter is not over. We're in a long-term battle for the future of America. We're in a long-term battle for the financial security of our nation. And yes, it's about our grandchildren, but as Mr. Bowles told us, as Senator Alan Simpson told us, as Alan Greenspan told us, we could have a debt crisis in just a few years. Wouldn't that be a disaster because of our failure to respond to the extraordinary debt that we're occurring, that we have an, a financial crisis that could put us back into recession? I hope not. I don't think that's uh, going to happen this year, but I don't know. We've been warned it might, and it's scary. So we're going to continue to talk about this. We're going to continue to use the rules of the Senate to try to force this Senate to comply with the rules of the United States Code. It says we should have a budget. We now have 757 days. How many more will it be before we have a budget? 
We're going to continue that battle. And it's going to be, uh, I think, a battle for the fi financial future of our country. Uh, hopefully, we'll be successful. Hopefully, uh, somehow, some way, as the pressure builds and the American people continue to have their voices heard, that the White House, who to date has been oblivious to these challenges, and that the Democratic Senate, which has been oblivious to these challenges, will somehow get on board and seriously work with the House to confront uh, the challenges we face and put us on the sound path to financial security for the future. I thank the Chair. Would yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Mr. President, Senator from Minnesota, I ask that the quorum call be vitiated. Without, without objection. Mr. President, I move to proceed to executive session to consider calendar number 118, and I send a cloture motion to the desk. Without objection, the motion is to agreed to. I ask Clerk consent. Clerk will report the nomination and the motion. I ask consent that on Monday, June 6. Nomination, Department of Justice, Donald B. Verrilli, Jr. of the District of Columbia to be Solicitor General of the United States. Cloture motion, we the undersigned senators in accordance with the provisions of Rule 22 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, hereby move to bring to a close the debate on the nomination of Donald B. Verrilli, Jr. of the District of Columbia to be Solicitor General of the United States, signed by 17 senators as follows. Leahy, Conrad, Carey, Whitehouse, Klobuchar, Cardin, Bingaman, Boxer, Merkley, Wyden, Menendez, Shaheen, Sanders, Lautenberg, Rita Rhode Island, Murray, and Durbin. I ask consent that on Monday, June 6, 2011, at 4.30 p.m., the Senate proceed to executive session to consider calendar number 118, that there be one hour for debate equally divided in the usual form prior to the cloture vote, Further, that the mandatory quorum under Rule 22 be waived. Objection. I ask consent to resume legislative session. Without objection. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent the Senate proceed to the consideration of calendar number 56, H.R. 754. Clerk will report. H.R. 56, H.R. 754, an act to authorize appropriations for fiscal year 2011 for intelligence and intelligence-related activities of the United States government and so forth and for other purposes. Without objection, the Senate will proceed to the measure. I ask consent the bill be read a third time and the Senate proceed to a vote on passage of the bill. Without objection. Clerk, clerk will re read the bill for the third time. Counter number 56, H.R. 754, an act to authorize appropriations for fiscal year 2011 for intelligence and intelligence related activities of the United States government and so forth and for other purposes. Questions is on the passage of the bill. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. Ayes appear to have it, ayes do have it. The bill is passed. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that the motion to reconsider be laid upon the table and that any statements related to the bill be placed in the record at the appropriate place as if read. Without objection. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent the Senate proceed to the consideration of calendar number 31, S627. Clerk will report. K. 
Calendar number 31, S627, a bill to establish the Commission on Freedom of Information Act processing delays. Without objection, the Senate will proceed to the measure. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent the committee reported amendments be agreed to. The bill as amended be read a third time and passed. The motions to reconsider be laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate, and any statements related to the bill be placed in the record at the appropriate place as if read. Without objection. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent the Veterans Affairs Committee be discharged from further consideration of SCON Resolution 4 and the Senate proceed to its immediate consideration. Clerk will report. Senate concurrent Resolution 4 expressing the sense of Congress that an appropriate site on Chaplin's Hill in Arlington National Cemetery should be provided for a memorial marker to honor the memory of the Jewish chaplains who died while on active duty in the armed forces of the United States. Without objection, the committee is discharged. The Senate will proceed to the measure. I ask unanimous consent.